Hey guys, Claw Land here with another episode of Left Hand Reviews. And today we're going to take a look at Saki and Samurai. Saki and Samurai was released in 2011 and published by Albe Pavo Games, a relatively new Italian based publisher. It was designed by Matteo Santis and plays in about 45 minutes with 3 to 8 players. The premise of this game is that you and several of your samurai buddies are sitting at a small local inn drinking sake. When all of a sudden, there's only one cup of sake left. Who will be the last samurai standing to drink that sake and become the most drunk samurai? Well, we'll have to find out. So as you can see, sake and samurai comes in a relatively small box, but don't let that fool you, there's a lot of game in here. The one thing I just wanted to point out before opening it up is the artwork. The artwork on Saki and Samurai is incredible. You can tell they spent a lot of time uh, with the character uh, drawings as well as the box background. I mean, you can see all these uh, patterns in the background. Even the Albe Pavo logo is very nice looking. Well, they did a very nice job with this box. And I just want to take a second to let people appreciate that because it's something that they didn't have to do. It adds no nothing to the game experience, uh, but it is simply gorgeous. Uh, their artist is amazing. So let's open it up here. So the first thing that you're going to see here is a full color rule book. The rule book here is four pages. It's just simply one folded sheet of paper. Uh, I just have a couple, this is an unofficial BGG printout of the turn order. This is the official uh, FAQ, double sided, and again, look at that great artwork on that. They didn't have to do that, but it's really neat. Glad that they did. A couple more of those uh, cheat sheets that I give to other players. This is another rule book, this is in Italian. And here we have an origami masu. A masu is the cup that will hold the sake. Now you can see uh, it has all the instructions on how to fold it. I am certainly not an origami expert. I just started uh, to create it uh, and I haven't finished yet. And I believe they also have some directions online, even a video online, uh, in case you can't follow the instructions, which is kind of hard anyway to follow those as it's becoming folded because you can't see them anymore. But I think that's just a really neat little touch that they added. Um, do a little origami. We have several full color laminated uh, player cards. Now, on one side is the the normal sam living samurai, and on the other side is their spirit of that samurai if they are killed in combat. And we'll get into that when I go over the um, explanation. But these are all unique. They each have their own unique special ability and they are amazing. The artwork is amazing. So we'll just take a second to appreciate each one. And like I said, these are a, a laminated. They're, they're, uh, it's kind of an interesting material. I haven't really seen in a lot of board games. Um, so they should last a long time. I mean, I feel like you could even spill something on it and it would be it would wipe right off because it's got that very slick, plasticky, laminated feel. It's not particularly thick per se, uh, but um, because of the finish on it, I think it probably should last a while. Then here we also have our step cubes and our sitting tokens. Our glass sake beads, and finally, all of the various cards in the game. So, here's the setup for a four player game of sake and samurai. Now, actually, I kind of compressed everything uh, closer to the table so we could get it all in frame. Um, in reality, you would definitely want to spread this out quite a bit um, on a much larger table or larger area. Um, and you'll see why you'll be adding cards and all sorts of things. But this is essentially how we'll start. In the center of the table, you have your masu, which I, again, haven't folded mine yet, um, with your sake beads in it. 
You're going to have 2.5 sake beads per player rounded up. So with four players, that would be 10. Then each player is going to start with a randomly selected um, samurai with a sitting token placed on the stance box. So each player is going to start the game still sitting. Then on the left hand side you're going to have a number of cards equal to their life points which you can see here this particular samurai has four. So at the beginning of the game he's going to draw four cards plus four more for your hand and randomly select four of them to go here and the remaining four in your hand. And So for example for this samurai that has five at the beginning of the game he has dealt nine cards. Five of them are randomly selected to go into the life points pile and the remaining four to your hand. Then each player starts wielding a katana in front of them. And each player starts with three of these step cubes between their neighbors. A step cube equals the number of steps you are away from all other samurai. So you can see that this samurai here, Masumune, is three steps away from each of his neighbors. And that carries over, which means he's also six steps away from this samurai here. So that's pretty, uh, pretty neat mechanic. <clears throat> Looking back at the player cards here, uh, I had mentioned this before. Up here is the weapon that you're wielding. Everyone starts with a katana. On the right-hand side here is where you place your wounds. So as you take wounds, you will place cards from your life pool over here on your wound side. And once you lose all your life points, obviously you are dead. Each Samurai card also has a special ability that's written in both Italian and English. So for example, this Samurai says discard one card and gain plus one attack. So each Samurai has a special ability, which is really neat. And then finally over here we have the draw pile. Basically the flow of the turn is as follows. You can play up to two cards, so zero, one, or two cards from your hand for two different actions, or uh, two of the same action. Then, if you have any minions in play, those minions are going to move and attack. Finally, you will draw two more cards into your hand. And then you have the ability to change which weapon you are currently wielding. There is a strict hand limit of four cards, so if at any point you have more than four, you must discard immediately down to four. So now let me go over the different card types, and that will make a little bit more sense. First card type are the white cards. White cards are either weapons or items. And you can see this is a Nodachi, which is a weapon. On the bottom left, you can see this has a weapon modifier of plus four to your attack, a defense modifier of zero. And it has a cube and then two, meaning in order to use this weapon against an opponent, you must be exactly two cubes or two steps away from your opponent to use this weapon. White cards are also uh, can be items and this is a pipe and the pipe is not a weapon but it does have an ability that says if you burn a sake all other players have to discard a card next we have the green cards these are your minions you can see this particular minion has an attack modifier of zero a defense modifier of zero he has to be one step away from an opponent and on his turn uh, during the minion movement phase he can move up to two steps Minions are basically used to uh, as cannon fodder to get in between you and your enemies because your enemies have to attack your minion uh, first before they can get at you. And every once in a while that your minion will have the ability to uh, cause some damage to your opponent. Next we have event cards. These are the yellow cards. And here's a pretty funny one called Burning Ramen. And all the event cards are obviously going to be uh, different and do different things. But this particular one uh, provides a ranged attack causing two damage and it must be three or more steps away so that's pretty neat if, if uh, I this samurai here played this it can do two damage to any samurai on the board at this point because all samurais are at least three or more steps away so he could do the attack against this samurai on the other side of the table it doesn't have to be one that's necessarily adjacent it just has to be three or more steps away that's pretty neat and finally you have the red interrupt cards and these you can play on your opponent's turn to interrupt what they're doing. You can see that this one called Falter immediately stops movement. So if your samurai uh, opponent was about to move, 
you just toss this, they can't move. And that can be good because they may, they're may they likely moving to get in position to use one of their weapons, and if you stop their movement, it prevents them from using it. So you probably also noticed that on the cards there are four symbols, which I didn't reference. Because when you play up to two cards on a turn, each card that you play can either be played for the card text, or for one of the symbols, which correspond to uh, four different actions. On the left-hand side is the attack. So you can discard this card uh, and use it as an attack, and it's going to do a two-power uh, attack, and it will add that to uh, the weapon that you're attacking with. So if I played this, it would be a base power of two, and if I was attacking with my Nodachi, it would add another four to that for a total attack strength of six. On the top right here is the defense value. When you are attacked, you can play a card from your hand to defend. So this gives you a base defense of 1. And you will add to that the defense of the weapon you are wielding. So in this case, the katana everyone starts wielding is plus 2. So you would have a total defense of 3. And that will cancel out 3 damage. On the bottom right, we have sake. So this is how you drink sake. So if you were to play this card, you would take one sake from the Masu. And finally, we have movement. This card does not allow any movement. And so, for example, the Nodachi card here allows two movement. Now, as I mentioned before, all the uh, samurai at the end here are start with a sitting token. And what that means is that they have the option to do a special move called the Iado. And the Iado is when you combine both movement and attacking in only one play of a card, which allows you another card play. You are always sitting until you move. So you can be attacked and defend for, uh, your attack, or you can attack from a sitting position, but as soon as you do a movement, you are no longer sitting and you must discard or the sitting token. So let's go through a quick example of each of the actions. Masamune is going to attack Gozen, and he's going to use his Iado skill. So the first thing he's going to do is play uh, an attack card. And he's going to play the pipe, which has an attack value of 2. And you're ignoring everything else on the card, of course, because we're just using it for that attack value. And he's announcing that he is doing his Iado. So he's going to move two steps towards his opponent, because that's the ability of the Iado. He's going to do a base 2 attack, plus he's going to be attacking with his katana. Uh, which gives him a plus three modifier for a total of five. Now when you move, what you're going to do is take a number of cubes from the side that you're moving towards and place them on the other side. So he's moving two steps towards Gozen. So now he's only one step away, and since he's moved closer to this samurai, he's farther away from this samurai. So it's a really neat intuitive mechanic that I really enjoy. So again, he's about to do five damage to Gozen because he is now within one step and he's attacking with his katana. His sitting token is discarded because of the Iado. And now Gozen has a chance to defend. So Gozen is going to play this card with a defense value of two, add it to his wielded weapons defense value of two for a total defense of four. So this card is discarded, this card is discarded, and so he is going to take one damage. And it's as simple as that. And now Masamune has one more uh, card action that they can take. And so what they're going to do is play the makeshift armor card from their hand, which is going to add a plus one defense for the rest of the game, or until this card is removed. So he just plays this down in front of them, and that's now currently in play. He doesn't have any minions to move, so there's no minion movement phase for this player. And he finishes his turn by drawing two more cards to his hand. Now that it's Gozen's turn, I'm going to cheat here real quick. And let's say that he had a minion card in his hand. So because he used a card last turn to defend, he now only starts his turn with three cards. And so Gozen is going to first play his Yari weapon. And so he plays that down here. Now, keep in mind that when you attack, you can attack with any weapon that you have in play. 
The weapon up here that you are wielding only accounts for defense. This is the weapon that you will be adding its defense modifier for when you are attacked with melee attacks. Now there are ranged attacks, and a ranged attack instead of having the sword symbol here will have a bow symbol, as you saw from the event card I had shown earlier. And ranged attacks cannot be defended with your uh, weapons. You can only defend against ranged attacks by playing a card from your hand and adding the defense value. There's no additional benefit from a wielded weapon for ranged attacks. So anyway, Gozen is going to play their Yari. So they now have an additional weapon here, and this weapon attacks from, uh, up, uh, from exactly three steps away. So he could play uh, another card to now attack this samurai, since they are exactly three steps away. But instead, Gozen is going to play a minion. So the minion card starts by being placed directly next to, or in the same space, so to speak, as your samurai. And since they have played, Gozen has played two cards. The card playing is over, and now we move to the minion phase. The minions are going to move two spaces. So normally you would place it in between uh, the cues, but again, like I said, we're kind of compressed here um, to save space. So let's just say it looks like that. And minions automatically attack during the minion phase when they are exactly one step away from an opponent or an opponent's minion. So he moved two, he's one step away, so he's going to attack this samurai here. The way you do that is you flip a card randomly from the deck and apply its attack value. This has an attack value of one, adds to the minion's attack power of zero. And luckily this samurai has our katana, which has a defense modifier of plus two, but they have to play a card from their hand to defend. This plus two is plus two to your defense. It doesn't do a plus two by itself. You have to play a card to initiate your defense. So, they're going to play their wakisashi for its value of zero. It adds a plus two to the katana, so that card is discarded. This card, ran, card that was randomly drawn is discarded, and the minion does no damage. So, the minion is very weak, as you can tell, but you just forced your opponent to discard a card. And that's going to be critical in this game, since you only allow four cards in your hand. Gozen's turn is now over, so they draw two cards and adds it to their hand. So it's now Takazaki's turn here, and Takazaki uh, is going to play the Wakasashi card and use it to drink some sake. So we're going to play that to the discard here and drink one sake. Now, here's the trick. Saki is victory points. Whoever has the most Saki at the end of the game is the winner. But when you drink Saki, you're becoming drunk, which is dulling your wits and senses. So when you drink a Saki, you must place it on one of your cards in front of you, or on your player card, or on your life stack. By placing it on one of your cards, you're disabling use of that card until that Saki token is removed. If you place a Saki onto your player card, you can no longer use the special ability on that card. And finally, if you place it onto your life stack, your life pool, it counts as an extra hit point, which is good, but there is a special ability that you can always do on your turn called Burning Your Soul, and that means drawing one of the cards from your life stack into your hand, and then you can use that card. Uh, so that's kind of a latch ditch, uh, ditch effort or a desperation move uh, most of the time. Uh, but again, if that Saki token is there, you do not have the ability to use that. So it's a trade-off, getting those victory points, getting a little drunk, um, and not being able to use various weapons. So, Takazaki is going to place it onto their life stack here, add another life point, and he's going to end his turn by attacking this minion. So he is exactly one step away from the minion, so he is at the proper distance to use the katana. He's going to play this card here, the Yari, for its attack value of zero, plus three for the katana, is a total of three. Now the minion will just, exactly the way they attacked, is draw a random card for defense. The defense value on this is 
2, plus their inherent defense of 0, so he's going to take 1 hit, and minions are very weak, so 1 hit is enough to kill them. So, they are all dead and discarded. And that ends this player's turn, draws 2 cards, and we move on to the 4th player. So let's talk a little bit more about the benefits of having Saki. Saki is those victory points, but what you can also do on your turn as Saki is burning a Saki at any time during your turn, you can use it to draw an additional card, or you can use it to play an additional card. And you can do that as many times as you want on your turn, but remember every Saki you burn is one victory point that you are losing. Also during your enemy's turn, you can burn a Saki to draw a card. So in case you have poor defensive cards and you're attacked, you can burn a Saki to draw another card and hope that you draw something with some good defense. And in addition, remember that there are several cards that provide uh, Saki advantages, such as the pipe here, where you can burn a Saki to uh, play some sort of special ability. So for example, this card here is an event card that you play and it's triggered by burning a Saki. It does a range 2, 4 strength um, ranged attack. So two step away, strength of four, it's ranged, meaning wielded weapons cannot block it. So powerful little card. Now, if at any time your samurai loses all their life cards, they are dead. Now, you're not out of the game. And this introduces probably my favorite mechanic um, of Saki and Samurai. So what's gonna happen is all your cards and any Saki you've accumulated are going to be discarded, including your hand as well. And any Saki that you accrued is removed from the game. It is not placed back into the Masu. Then you're going to flip your card over to the spirit side, and you are now an evil, angry spirit of Enma. And now the four cards, or five, depending on your strength of your samurai, that were used in your life pool are now added to your hand as the Spirit of Enma, and you're going to play these cards uh, from the back side, because the cards have three different colored symbols, yellow, blue, and there's also uh, red. Now as a Spirit, your turn is going to be totally different. The first thing that you're going to be able to do is use the Power of Elation, and that means you can play one of the, the cards from your hand, but you can only play the card from your hand whose color matches the current face-up card on the draw pile. And each color corresponds to a different action. So, if a blue card is face-up, then the spirit player can play a blue card from their hand, and blue says, take one card from the hand of any samurai and give it to another samurai. And if there's only one living samurai left, that one card that you take is discarded. So, you're really messing with the other players. If a yellow card was face-up here, the spirit could play a yellow-backed card, and the yellow says take one sake drink from any card on any samurai and place it on any other card of the same samurai. So you're swapping around their sake drinks. And finally, red, if you're to play a red card, it says add or remove a step counter. So you would take a step counter from somewhere on the board and um, add it somewhere else, or take a step counter uh, anywhere from the board and remove it from play. Now one thing I also uh, failed to mention is that when you are killed you're immediately going to look on either side of you and whichever side has the most step cubes boom remove from the game because spirits uh, no longer inhibit movement they kind of fade into the mist right and now these two players are now only one step away from each other so after the spirit player completed uh, their elation, the next thing that they're going to do is draw the top card off of the deck. And so that's going to reveal, obviously, uh, potentially a new color. So, then the third and final step of the uh, player's round when they are a spirit is to either torment a samurai or to steal Saki. If they decide to steal Saki, they simply take a Saki from the... Uh, Masu and place it on their board. If they decide to torment a samurai, then what they do is they select a samurai uh, on the board and because spirits do not 
are not affected by steps. They can choose any samurai they want. Then they need to play a number of cards, their choice of a number of cards, equal to the colored back of the face-up card on the deck, which has potentially just changed because previously we drew a card, so you got to keep that in mind. So they will play a yellow card, their only uh, yellow card. And what they will do is it allows them to steal Saki from a living samurai. And it is treated just like uh, damage, so or just like an attack. So he's doing a one attack to uh, this samurai here because the samurai has one Saki. And the uh, samurai here has the option to play a card from their hand to act as defense uh, against uh, the stealing of the Saki. Uh, and then this card will be discarded. Now what's pretty neat about this game is that other samurai, let's say, can become dead. Okay, so let's say this a little bit later in the game. This samurai was killed also. Now these two samurai are dead. Are now spirits. So let's say um, it is now uh, this player's uh, turn again, and they're gonna they played a yellow card. And what can happen is all other spirits can contribute to the torture. So this uh, spirit could contribute a yellow card as well, and thus do a level two attack. You might say, well, he only has one one Saki, so what's the point of combining two together? Well, like I said, it's just like a level two attack. So if this samurai is able to only block one of that two, they're still going to lose that one Saki. And the Saki is stolen and given to the spirits. Now, why would the spirits want to help each other out? Well, here's the reason. Once all the Saki is removed, the last Saki is removed from the Masu, the final death round occurs, and there, every player has one more turn. The winner of the game is the samurai uh, that has the most sake, or all spirits combine all their sake together and can win as a group. So let's say at the uh, end of the round, say this guy had th three sake, but the spirits had a combined total of four, the spirits automatically win and defeat the samurai. If the samurai, if this one samurai, had the most, then he wins the game. So, it's a really neat mechanic that the uh, spirits, after they die, are going to work together and, and work for a combined joint victory, whereas the living samurai is still on their own. And so, it, it's, it's really interesting how it works, because once you have dead samurai, these samurai are going to be teaming up against the living, and the living samurai have to not only work to accrue the sake for themselves, but they also need to be wary of other living samurai that may be going after them, but then these two also have to form some sort of uh, possible alliance against the dead samurai because they're a force to be reckoned with when you have multiple samurai ganging up, or multiple uh, spirits ganging up on the samurai. And then just one final thing is uh, there is some defense against the, the, the spirits is that the samurai can attack spirits, and spirits are not affected by steps, so it goes the same way. So a uh, samurai can attack any spirit. They're going to play an attack card. In order to block the attack, the player, the spirit player, must play cards from his hand whose backs equal the current face-up card. So in this case, let's say uh, this samurai attacks this spirit with, say, a value, of two, value 2 attack. Well, if he succeeds in that value to attack, the spirit is going to lose to Saki, and they are removed from the game, as opposed to being given to that samurai. So they would be removed from the game. But in order to block that attack, instead of playing a defensive card, because the spirits no longer use the other side of the cards, they must play cards whose backs equal the current face-up card, um, which in this case is yellow. He has no yellow cards, but other players... Uh, other spirits can contribute to their defense if other spirits had yellow cards. So again, it kind of um, furthers that almost team mechanic between the spirits. So that's really the main mechanics of the game. Uh, there may be a couple little rules here or there that I left out, but that's really the nuts and bolts of it. 
Um, also, what I, I didn't mention at the beginning is the game does come with uh, summary cards that are printed in English on one side, Italian on the other. And I'll just uh, give you a definition of all the iconography. Uh, really, it's really quick and easy to learn, so you probably won't even use these after the first couple turns. But it's nice that they included those. And also, there are uh, several uh, location cards, which are double-sided. And uh, these you can choose to play with, and they're just going to add uh, a little bit to the game, break some of the rules, or add some special things. So, for example, if you decide to play at the distillery, at the beginning of your turn, take one sake drink from the Masu without playing a card. So that will make the, the sake you know, go faster. Or you have on the other side here the dojo. Whenever a player, or whenever you play a weapon, immediately make a free attack using this weapon, weapons attack and steps value. So there it is in a nutshell. I uh, hope you got a good idea. So let me uh, wrap it up and tell you what I think. So let me tell you what I think about Saki and Samurai. As I kind of mentioned before, um, let me find the box here. The uh, artwork is very, very nice. It's exceptional. I uh, have a thing for Asian art. I have a lot of uh, little trinkets and uh, some paintings and things um, in my home. Uh, so I can really appreciate the artwork here. They spent a lot of time on and got a great artist. As well as these player cards, while not being a standardized size that you can sleeve, um, and I generally prefer to sleeve things like this, um, they are laminated and I think they will stand up for a little bit of abuse as long as you're careful of the, of the corners. Um, but uh, the, the cards themselves I think should, should last a fair amount of time. And the artwork again, I just want to show you, is amazing and I think it's really neat how they have a spirit side as well. Uh, the cards, the card stock is very good. They're printed very well. They're just a standard uh, standard card size. So easy to sleeve uh, if you're like me and I will be sleeving this game. Uh, the step cubes, they're unpainted uh, wooden cubes uh, but they are big. They're much larger than the standard uh, Euro cube which I think is a nice little touch. They could have given you little tiny cubes but these uh, larger, more substantial cubes are nice. Uh, the mechanics of the game are a lot of fun. Uh, this is definitely a beer and pretzels style game, or sake and pretzels, uh, have you. And uh, it's meant to be played, I think, with a group of friends and have a lot of fun. I think it plays probably a little bit better with more people um, than it does with, with the base three. Um, but it does get a little bit hectic, and there's a lot of things going on, and uh, there's some little funny special rules in there, like you have to call the oldest player San at the end of their name, like I would be Andy San. Um, and uh, when you take Saki, you scream out Saki, and things like that. So it's definitely a, a social game. Uh, it's not meant to be a hardcore uh, Euro. It's meant to be a game that you have a lot of fun with your friends, and you joke and laugh, and, and uh, get drunk at the same time. So... Uh, it's a really enjoyable game and I appreciate it, but there is uh, one major negative that I have to point out, and that is this. This is the rule book, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it was definitely translated from Italian, uh, but uh, the sentences and everything is very coherent, uh, so it's not like uh, there's broken English, but it is extremely, extremely vague. It is it, not to put down this publisher because I really enjoy this game. I'll be keeping this game, but the uh, rule book, uh, in my opinion, was very poorly done. And after just uh, getting through, um, you know, my first few games of Civilization, which is an extremely meaty game, uh, that rule book was exceptional. The best rule book I've ever read. So now comparing it to something like this. Uh, is a huge disappointment. Uh, you read through this and everything makes sense, but then you start playing the game and you realize there's all these different situations that the rules really didn't get into. Um, and, well, what happens when you do this? Or what happens when you do that? Or what does this really mean? Or, you know, it's just not specific enough uh, that it answers all the questions. So I spent a lot of time on the forums, uh, a lot of time emailing the designer back and forth. I found that the official FAQ, which did help. Um, but I did have to spend a lot of time um, uh, clarifying a lot of the questions I had, as well as the layout of the rules is not very well done. It's not particularly easy to find what you're looking for. 
um, as kind of the different actions and things are spread out throughout the rules. Um, so I think maybe next time around they could spend a little bit more time on uh, the rule set to make it a lot more clear. Maybe I'm just a stupid American and in Italy they, uh, they're just much more intelligent. But uh, for me, I like to have things spelled out to a T with examples, kind of the Chad Jensen GMT style where there is no room for question. So that's uh, the, really the only thing about this game that uh, was uh, a detriment to it. But again, if poor rules does not kill the game. It just makes it take a little bit longer to learn. You have to do a little bit of research on the forums. But after you do that, you play the game a few times. It is a ton of fun. I love this game. So if you're in the mood for a, uh, a, uh, a lightish, light medium, uh, you know, social type game uh, with your gaming group or group of friends, something you can play while uh, drinking some sake and uh, maybe some snacks, I definitely suggest that you check out Sake and Samurai. It's a really fun game. And actually, I uh, just I got an email uh, from the publisher saying that they're working on a Another game, I believe was called uh, Beer and Vikings, um, don't quote me on that, but they said uh, it's going to be a very similar concept and you'll actually be able to um, shuffle kind of those cards in with this game, uh, as well as playing it standalone, I'm sure. So I'm really excited uh, for that to come out. I'm sure they'll fix maybe a couple of the uh, rules, uh, the vagueness of some of the rules in that version. I'm really excited to check that out because this is a lot of fun. So, thanks for watching. Hold on, don't go just yet. I have a special announcement to make. At the beginning of the episode, you may have noticed the Eclectic Zeal logo, and that's because Left Hand Reviews, I'm proud to say, is now sponsored by EclecticZeal.com. And as a faithful watcher of Left Hand Reviews and other 2D6.org video reviewers, we are able to offer you an additional discount off their already low prices. So if you put in the a uh, promo code left hand when you're checking out that's going to give you an additional 3% off your purchase. So, you can't go wrong with that. So, I appreciate everyone watching uh, Left Hand Reviews. Uh, enjoy shopping at eclecticzeal.com. Thanks for watching and happy gaming.